Hey, Tesla fans, welcome to another episode of the Tesla Universe podcast. I'm your host, Cameron Prince. Thanks for joining me tonight. Uh, in this uh, episode, we're going to look at uh, part two of the Charlotte Muzar interview. Got that coming up shortly. Uh, also going to take a look at uh, an update on the Colorado Springs lab model. Um, but before those, uh, let's talk about some Tesla news. Um, this week, we released approximately 30 new articles on the website. Um, a lot of good content there uh, related to Colorado Springs. And one article that uh, stands out in particular is from uh, my friend Mark Seifer. Uh, this article was, um, uh, it was written several years ago, uh, and it has to do with... Um, the reality of wireless power transmission from a technical perspective. So Mark takes a pretty deep dive into the subject and it's a good read. Highly recommend it. Uh, also, uh, yesterday, uh, released a, um, a video from one of my mentors, uh, Bill Weissock. Uh, this video, um, is it's focus on Tesla coils and in particular, um, the nonlinear um, relation between spark length and the voltage output of a Tesla coil. So highly recommend that. Um, one of my other friends, also uh, a protege of Bill Weissock, uh, Jeff Parisi, uh, he commented recently that um, this was uh, around the time of Bill's heyday. And, and you can really see that in the video. Um, he's super confident, super smart. Um, just, uh, I respect him very much. This was also the same year that, uh, Bill Weissach was featured in, uh, a lightning article in National Geographic, a really, um, really prestigious thing back in those days. Uh, so uh, I'll link both of those in the description. Check those out. And uh, speaking of Mark Seifer, I wanted to give him a shout out uh, about his new book. This is uh, was recently released. It's his second biography about Tesla, kind of a continuation of the first. This one is called Tesla Wizard at War, which is a follow up to his uh, initial book, also called Wizard. Um, I understand this has hit the bestseller list, so congratulations, Mark. And thank you so much for sending me this copy. I'm going to read it right away, and hopefully we'll do a review in an upcoming podcast. Um, I also understand that uh, Mark is doing some book signings, so check his website, uh, markcipher.com, for uh, those dates. Maybe you can get yourself a signed copy. All right, so let's uh, move on to the um, the video uh, interview of Miss Muzar. Now I've done some digging, and I th I'm I'm happy to say that I've located um, the source of this video. Um, something was just bugging me, and I I kept digging, and I found it um, back in 2000. Uh, PBS produced uh, what many would probably agree is the best documentary on Tesla. Uh, it was called Master of Lightning, and it had an accompanying book, a hardcover book, with really great photos and very well written. Uh, that was um, authored by um, Margaret Shaney, who was uh, who had formerly or pri released prior to that, uh, Man Out of Time, another great Tesla biography. Um, also, Robert Ute, uh, those two um, were the uh, producers of that uh, video and book. And they, um, they had a, a segment, or a couple of segments actually, with uh, Miss Muzar. And those were taken from the tape uh, that uh, we're, we're sharing in, in the podcast. So what we're looking at is kind of the uncut full version of the interview um, and what we saw on, or what we can see on the documentary is two clips probably no more than 20 seconds total so on that original documentary you, you had uh, very small snippets of the interview and now we're getting to see the whole thing 
so before we start the video, I wanted to, you know, just give you a little more background on Miss Muzar. Tesla Museum, 1952 through 2003. This book was written by my friend Zorica Siverich, and it is the definitive source of information about the Nikola Tesla Museum. It documents how the museum was established, um, the process that uh, they went through to catalog the estate and arrange it, uh, just a wealth of information about the museum um, available there. Now, Zorica and I are friends. Uh, we actually uh, met twice in 2017, once in Barcelona, and here we're pictured in Serbia. Um, you can see the book down here to the lower left. Uh, she actually autographed it for me uh, during this trip, so thank you so much for that, Zorica. Um, also have a few pictures, um, and why I'm bringing this book up is because uh, it includes content related to Charlotte Muzar. Uh, here she is pictured. Um, she made three trips to the museum. Uh, the first when the uh, contents of the estate uh, were transferred from the United States to Serbia. That would be 1952. Um, now this second visit, which is what this picture is, uh, is from, uh, it was in 1957. And this is uh, when the museum was... Uh, the grand opening, if you will, uh, and also uh, this is the trip uh, when Miss Muzar brought over Tesla's ashes, and that was at the request of Tesla's niece. Um, she wanted the family wanted the ashes there, so Miss um, Muzar was entrusted with that task, and uh, here you can see um, her uh, during that visit. She's talking with Mr. Sweezy. Uh, he was a reporter for the New York Sun newspaper, and uh, he met Tesla in the early 1900s, I'm sure at probably one of the um, birthday uh, celebrations that Tesla allowed uh, the media to interview him, and he typically had uh, a lot of articles uh, around that time. So I'm sure Mr. Sweezy was probably one of those reporters that got to meet him during that time and they became friends um there are um a number of mentions in in different sources where um, tesla spent time with him and was you know probably one of his um few friends during the latter part of his life uh we've got a couple of more pictures here um this is during that uh, grand opening and we see miss muzar and uh, mr sweezy there again uh, with Tesla's statue behind them. Um, another really good uh, thing about the book is it shows us um, how that uh, the museum staff there documented the process uh, of, of establishing the museum. And here we see uh, pictures of, of Miss Muzar along with um, Sava Kasanovich. They're actually going through the the uh, the estate contents and and if you notice there's a slight smile on uh, miss muzard's face i'm i'm sure this was like a treasure hunt you know so uh, she's clearly having a good time looks like she has a a pair of uh tesla's boots there in her hand uh here's a couple of more uh looks like they're going further into that same trunk and uh, here's another one where it um, looks like a wardrobe uh, is being uh, inventoried. So um, as I told you, Miss Muzar um, has firsthand information about Tesla. And we're going to hear from her again now. Hold it. I should tell you what happened with the uh, Office of Alien Property, huh? Well, well I, can, I, I was going to ask you, but please. Okay. Um, before, even before the funeral, immediately, uh, the f Office of Alien Property took over, and um, they sealed the room. 
they had all the things, papers, because Tesla had a room adjoining his where he kept a lot of, had furniture, I think the furniture in there, what I saw that day when I was, uh, when he died, was a dresser and things like that, hotel furniture. But there were boxes and barrels and files of papers, documents, everything in this room. Well, anyway, this all was packed and sent to the Manhattan storage on 7th Avenue in New York. And it stayed there, all of Tesla's papers. So we really, no one else had seen any of his papers at that point. But, and it was uh, several days later when uh, the Office of Alien Property formally released this property in care of Mr. Kasanovich as his heir. Tesla had another heir in, um, in the United States, and that was Nikola Trebojevich, who then was living in Detroit. But he waived any uh, rights to this in favor of his cousin, Kasanovich. <clears throat> well, was there any discussion uh, between you and Kasanovich at the time about just why the Office of Alien Property was the agency in charge of compounding these papers? <clears throat> about the, um, about the um, Office of Alien Property, um, uh, interest or involvement in Tesla estate was probably due to the fact that Kasanovich was an alien and he was the heir. So by natural process, he would, all this property of Tesla's would go to him. And there was a lot of talk then about secret weapons and negotiations with the USSR, and he was supposed to have a meeting with Mrs. Roosevelt about some kind of a, um, a war weapon that um, he had developed. There was all kind of talk, you know. But um, no one ever explained anything to Kasanovich, as far as I know, why they sealed, uh, sealed the property. Anyway, before Kasanovich left for um, London, he went to the warehouse to check out the things that they were there and to make arrangements for the warehouse to send bills to me wherever I was that I would handle it. Hold it. <coughs> I'm enjoying it, in fact. It's kind of like reading a book. That's what somebody says. I like reading, you know, and someone did, says... Did you start your tape, by the way? Yeah. Someone says, uh, wrote someplace, reading is like having someone talk to you alone for a long time. I like that. <laughs> it's true. So anyway, All right. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Sure. Where do you want to put it? My nose and that. <laughs> my mouth. All right. You know. Before Mr. Kasanovich's departure from New York for London, this was in 43. No, 44. 44. He went to the um, warehouse to check out the situation. Maybe uh, since there's so much space in there, we got to just say in 44 Kasanovich. All right, in 44 Kasanovich was asked to come to London to help form a provisional government between the royal cabinet and the uh, forces that were in power in Yugoslavia and so forth. And before departing, he went to the um, warehouse to check on the uh, estate, on the papers and so forth. I have to be. We have lots of tape and lots of time. <laughs> this is, I'm telling you, off the record. I mean, off the record. Yeah. If you really mean it, don't say it now. <coughs> the tape is wrong. No, really? It's probably awesome. You want us to stop it? Stop it. It's okay, now it's 
there was a retired paraplegic doctor in New Chicago, Dr. McCabe. Bet you don't know about him. He used to type with an instrument on his seat. Well, he got through the information, Freedom of Information Act, the FBI report on Kasanovich, and it seemed for a while they suspected him of being a spy. So that's why the alien property was brought in and so forth, Office of Alien Property. Anyway, back to 1944. Mr. Kasanovich went to the warehouse and uh, he talked to the workers there because he wanted to physically see what, they, what this property consisted of, what was up. And these fellows that worked there, they said, you know, one night some guys, a lot of guys from FBI came in and they photographed everything. They opened everything and photographed it. Now, how true this was, or we don't know. Let me ask you one question. Though. Did they specifically say FBI? Because, you know, during the war, everything was FBI. Everybody was afraid of J. Edgar Hoover. So they, they, this, to, to them, it was FBI. <clears throat> That's what they said. They probably didn't ask them. They were workers there. They had, hadn't the authority. So anyway, uh, and far as Mr. Kasanich was concerned, he didn't see this, uh, the trunks and the boxes before they were, when they were taken out of the hotel, and they, they, he, so he didn't know if there was any difference or anything like that. So anyway, um, Mr. Kasanovich came back to, um, to America in 19... Well, what was uh, Kasanovich's reaction to this? He was upset, <clears throat> but he... You have used the name, Kasanovich, was he? Oh, Mr. Kasanovich was upset about all of this, but what could he do? He was a guest in this country, and he had no proof that anybody had been in there to look at the things. In fact, I'll, I'll skip ahead. <clears throat> he came to the United States as ambassador, and before he left, he called J. Edgar Hoover, spoke to him personally, and he said it was a call to my attention in 1944 that the Tesla papers and things were inspected and photographed by your people. Hoover says categorically, no such thing happened. So we don't know any further. I don't know any further. What further? But as it developed later, these papers were taken all over the country. <coughs> and I have to... You know, um, what papers? <laughs> His uh, files. Yeah, this is, this is, it's so hard to figure out. Um, just tell us, for, use your own imagination or use your own instincts and, and tell us what are the kinds of papers that they're talking about and where did they go? What do you think? It's so big, you know. It's, um, it's hard to say. Oh, Wait a minute. And, nah. It's hard to say what was in the papers because none of, no one really looked at them. They were just packed and shipped into the warehouse. And we didn't. Mr. Kasanovich and three other fellows and I were in a committee in 1957 who opened the safe and opened all of these boxes and boxes and trunks and everything available. Mr. Sorry, may I correct you? I think that was 1951. Two, 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 two. No, it wasn't. You're right, you're right. Second alive. time, Mr. Kasanovich died in 56. Sorry. No, <clears throat> okay. Um, I'm going to go back. When we say, <clears throat> when we say papers, that's copies of his work, his sketches, his formulas. I don't know. I can look at that for 
10 years, I wouldn't know what it means, you know. What work he did, because I'm not a scientist, I'm not a mathematician, I'm not a physicist. But he would, uh, uh, when uh, Mr. Kusanovich uh, finished university, he came here to visit his uncle. This is in the 1930s. And he'd like to go, <laughs> he took his nephew, Tesla took his nephew to a movie on 42nd Street, one of these all-night movies. He watched cowboy pictures. And he told his nephew, you know, I come here and I look at these cowboy pictures and I work out some of the hardest problems I have with my inventions. See, that's the way his mind works. So who can understand any of his a layman, huh, these things? But anyway, in 1952, I had finished this course. I went to Yugoslavia to help establish a secretarial school and to teach there. And when I finished with that, we graduated two nice grades of people. And uh, I was taken to this building, 51 Proletarske Brigade, which is now the museum. And we commenced opening all of these boxes and trunks and everything, artifacts and everything, his uh, old clothes with a, that he brought or his family sent him from the old country, you know, and his top hat, his fancy duds that he wore when he was uh, the uh, lion, social lion in New York. Uh, so the first, that's then I pulled out my slip of paper with, it, uh, with the uh, safe combination. We opened it. <clears throat> we looked through the whole safe, no gold medal. It was missing. And that bunch of keys, which is the last thing thrown into the safe before well, the doors were closed and the lock turned, was missing. And we had so many things that were locked, so what to do? Eventually we found this whole mess of keys that we had last put in the safe among a box or some stuff that had no relation or connection with the safe. So someone had been through there, right? It would appear that way. But what, what was among all of this uh, business, about, among all of these uh, files, and who had gone through them, what was taken up, who can know? The people in the museum certainly wouldn't know. Because as I said, Mr. Kosanovich came to the United States as ambassador to, uh, from Yugoslavia. And uh, in 50, before he left, we went to New York, saw Philip Wittenberg, and made arrangements with him to advertise settlement, d debts owed by Nikola Tessa, so they'd be all settled. And. He, Tesla had property, he had barrels and trunks fulls of property in different hotels in New York when he couldn't pay his bills, why he had to move, so they kept his, uh, whatever he had in storage there, they kept it there. So this was all collected and packed and shipped to Yugoslavia, and as fate would have it, I was on the boat that was bringing all of this stuff, including the furniture from his room. And then next I saw it, of course, the furniture was there in the museum. And then the second time I went there, I brought Tesla's ashes to the museum. That was in 57. Right. Yeah. Okay, what did you think? I believe my favorite part was uh, when Miss Muzar talks about uh, Sava Kasanovich making that call to J. Edgar Hoover and he uh, categorically denying the existence of an investigation related to Nikola Tesla. And we just know that that's not true thanks to the Freedom of Information Act that uh, revealed uh, a lot of documents from that investigation. So we'll uh, pick up next week and see more from Miss Muzar. Uh, for right now, let's check in on the Colorado Springs model. Now, what we're looking at here is an enlargement uh, and cropped version of one of the Colorado Springs Labs photos, 
one of my favorites and probably one of the best as far as determining uh, dim dimensions of the lab. So what I've done here um, is I've resized this image to be what I believe uh, equates uh, one pixel to one inch. So um, most of the opinions that I've read um, indicate, and I agree with this opinion, that um, we can determine a, a size reliably from the doors of the lab and you can see those on either side of the red box. Now, um, the common opinion is that those are made up. Uh, each door is made up of three one by tens, making each door 30 inches or 60 inch uh, total doorway opening. So that's what I've outlined here with the red box. Now, our, our box below that, we're uh, stretching from uh, one side to the other. And that's giving us a number of 654 pixels. If we divide that, um, that gives us uh, 54 and a half feet. So this is what I'm going to go with um, for uh, the width of the building for the model. Um, you know, we can't, there's no way to be totally accurate, but... Um, I believe this is going to be the best I can do, and this is what I'm going to start with. Now, as I mentioned, I'm building the model in SketchUp. So if, you know, as I'm building this, uh, I see that, uh, you know, there's more uh, information, there's more evidence to support a different size, we'll adjust it. Uh, so that's a good thing about building uh, the model uh in software first rather than you know getting started with it uh, physically so speaking of SketchUp we'll switch over uh, and take a look at what I've got so far now this is what I envision uh, the foundation under the lab might look like um, we know that Tesla didn't have any unfinished or uncut wood uh, in the lab whatsoever in the in the photos from you know the visual examination all the wood is is nicely cut and uh, clearly came from a sawmill so I have no reason to think that Tesla would use unfinished wood in the foundation um, also if you look at the the floor the pictures of the floor of the lab um, you'll see that it's really nice and flat there's no bows. There's, I mean, it looks like um, a professionally installed uh, wood floor. So it had to have some sort of, of decent foundation. And, and think about this, too. Um, there were a lot of heavy things like, you know, Westinghouse transformers and uh, tubs full of capacitor, uh, saltwater capacitors that uh, Tesla was supporting here. Now, most of the floor was vacant, we know, because the, the coil took up so much space. But I can't imagine that um, Tesla would make one floor, one part of the floor better than another um, because, you know, there's no, you know, he, he, was, he was experimenting, right? So he might move or, or switch his equipment around, and obviously you wouldn't want to tear the floor up to do that. So... This is my best guess um, as to how uh, that floor might be arranged. And if we zoom in here, um, you can see that um, what I've used is 2x12s. Uh, and these are arranged uh, much like you would see a, a deck where you have um, floor joists that are connected or uh, have no central supporting structure to link them. Um, the reason I didn't use central beams of some sort is because, um, according to the information I've read, uh, it was very rare, if at all, you would see hangers of some sort connecting joists. Um, they just didn't have that material back then. Um, you know, we buy them at Home Depot and Lowe's all day long, but that's not something that was readily available uh, back then from my understanding. So um, 
what I've done in here is uh, these are two by twelves that are overlapping two feet. Um, we have one side that is uh, alter they're alternating kind of sides where one the the shorter stud is on the left and then on the right and it alternates back and forth. Uh, we have bracing uh, in between the floor joist, uh, no more than every eight feet. Uh, and they alternate so that uh, you can drive the nails on either side. Um, the outer floor joist or uh, frame uh, foundation frame is um, just scabbed together with two by fours. Um, so you know, I don't know if this is going to live up to modern day code, but I'm going to go with this for now. Um, and like I said, if we need to adjust it, um, that's no problem. So, you know, I don't know everything. I'm not a, a construction expert, certainly uh, not for this era. If anyone has ideas or comments, suggestions, please feel free to uh, drop those in the comments. I'd, I'd love your feedback. One other thing I wanted to talk about related to the uh, Colorado Springs lab is the lack of posts uh, being used in its construction. You know, we would typically see in a barn or um, structure of that day posts buried in the ground and then the, the walls nailed to them. Or, you know, uh, there would be a central post every so many feet and then um, standard um uh, studs between them but we don't see that in tesla's lab and uh, instead we see bracing on the outside of the building um, on all three sides other than the front um, there are what appears to be 25 foot long two by fours uh, three per side that are propped up in an angle bracing the walls and, and you know that kind of baffled me i'm like why would tesla you know, use that external bracing. And it kind of dawned on me. Uh, it's the same reason that Tesla didn't use metal for the roof. Um, Tesla had to be concerned with uh, stray capacitance uh, and, more importantly, targets for arcing. Um, we know that Tesla had water hoses, and he talks of uh, dealing with fires breaking out uh, pretty regularly in his notes. So it was a constant threat. And I'm sure that Tesla had, this was not something new to him. He, he, his lab had burned down several years earlier. So fire was, I'm sure, very keen on his mind. And think about it. If, if a power arc hits one of those um, posts that potentially was buried in the ground, um, that arc is going to carbonize that post. And, uh, you know, from there out, uh, it would be a constant target. It would be very difficult to insulate it uh, once it was carbonized. And, uh, you know, that's that's my theory um, because, you know, if that did happen, that's not something that's easily replaceable or repairable. So I believe that's why Tesla didn't use the post. Um, I think that's it for today. Um, thank you so much for watching. Please join us next week where we continue the Charlotte Muzar interview. Have a good day.